I thought about that little five foot two inch American lady who would sometimes, I'm assuming, prob probably not this uh, actual piece of furniture, but would stand in this space. How would we relate to her today? She came to where we worship. She came to where we work. And she said, hey, I got a message for you. Just got it last night. I know what I would do. I'd start trembling. <laughs> what, what, what did God show her? But amazing grace, unending love, what the kids just sang about. That was the keynote of her life. Keynote of, of her ministry. I had the privilege last evening of sitting four or five rows back beside a young woman. We introduced ourselves. Her name is Trish. And uh, I know one thing that would not have been here when Ellen White preached. These uh, cushions that roll right off when you sit on them. <laughs> I'm telling you. I knocked my Bible three or four times. Michael, while you're preaching, my Bible's going over. And she has to kind of straighten up because I'm sliding over with it. But she works for Kellogg. I don't know if she's here, but she works for Kellogg. She's Trisha Wood. She's, she's Woody's uh, sis. And you know what she does with the Kellogg cor a Corporation? She's in charge of all internal auditing for the Americas. Now, go figure. Young adult. She's a young adult. In fact, where is she? you got to see that she's a young adult. Is she here? Trish? Come on, Trish, just stand up. Because I'm so proud. We've got somebody high up in the Kellogg Corporation. And, uh, yeah. And now she's used to these red uh, cushions anyway. And so, but Trish, seriously, thank you for... Not just what you do for Kellogg, but how you represent Jesus on the job. God bless you. But when I think of Kellogg, I not only, I not only think of this aging city, I think of cornflakes. Mm -hmm. And Kellogg, oh, about 10, 20 years ago, came up with a brilliant marketing strategy for boomers. And I'm one of those. And the marketing strategy went like this. Taste them again for the first time. Now, how can you taste something again for the first time? But you can. And boy, that's what, I want to, that's what I want to tell everybody every time I get a chance to think about Ellen White in public. Taste her again for the first time. Taste her again for the first time. I know you may have had just a, if you're a boomer, just, just a, kind of a downer experience with how she was used where you grew up or where you went to school or even your own home. Taste her again for the first time. I got three convictions on my heart, and I'll pray with you. And they're driving me right now. This is my post-pioneer life. Three convictions. And God is saying, Dwight, I'm expecting you to help me do something about these three. All right? So here they are. Number one, we are living on the edge of eternity. I'm absolutely convinced. Number two, after hearing that rousing uh, presentation on the Millerites, it's just as true today, Kevin and Michael, just as true. Number two, Jesus is coming soon. And number three, America is in trouble. Big trouble. Let's pray. Oh, God. Unending love, amazing grace. The kids just sang it. Our hearts were blessed. These fine, young, Millerite inheritors. And bless, bless them. Bless Battle Creek Academy to the max. God bless America. We're going to be very candid with each other in our thinking. We love this land. Some of us, I know not all of us, some of us get tears in our eyes. 
when we sing, oh, beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of green. America, America, God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. Draw us in to how we must respond right now. For the glory of Jesus alone, we pray together. Amen. 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 Here's your eyes, Smith. Come. Okay, so this, this is Adventist Review. Review and Herald, June 17, 1862. Compare these sentiments. So he's just been talking about these noblemen. These are his words who graced the early period of this republic. Compare these sentiments with the blasphemous and insane ravings of pro-slavery demagogues of the present day on this question. What question are you talking about, Uriah? I'm talking about slavery. The whitewashed villainy of many of the pulpits of our land in relation to it and the strenuous efforts put forth to foster and extend this diabolical system. This is in the review. And mark the contrast to him who reads the signs of the times, everybody in this space included. These things are significant. They give us something of an idea of how rapidly the dragonic, I've never seen that word before, <laughs> the dragonic spirit, Who's the dragon in the apocalypse? Who's the dragon? Come on, it's the devil. That old serpent called Satan, right? The dragonic spirit of this nation has of late years developed itself in accordance with the prophecy in Revelation 13, verse 11. I'm going to go through that prophecy with you just on a, on, on a split second. But I want you to go back to that. Nobody talks about Revelation 13. We refer to it, as we heard this morning. But you need to see it for yourself, all right? James Y., what do you have to say? Another co-founder. There are three of them. By the way, Joseph Bates buried over in Al Allegan, Michigan, to the west. I'm pointing to the west. Uh, Uriah Smith, right here in, what is it, the Oak, Oak, Hill. Oak Hill Cemetery. James White, of course, here in Oak Hill Cemetery. I want to get to that cemetery sometime this afternoon. I've seen it as a kid in the seminary. James White, weighing in. For the past 10 years, the review has taught that the United States of America were, that's his word, were a subject of prophecy and that slavery is pointed out in the prophetic word as the darkest and most damning sin of this nation. It is taught that heaven has wrath in store for the nation. Now, they're not afraid about writing this and publishing it for the whole America to read, possibly. They're unashamed. It is taught that heaven has wrath in store for the nation which it would drink to the dry dregs as due punishment for the sin of slavery. And the anti-slavery teachings of several of our publications based upon certain prophecies have been such that, guess what? Their circulation, anybody surprised, has been positively forbidden in the slave states. Get that magazine out of here. Don't, we, don't, don't let me ever see that in your house or come into your, your post office box. Those of our people who voted at all in the last presidential election to a man, literally a man, suffrage, as we heard this morning, didn't come till 1920, women aren't voting, to a man voted for Abraham Lincoln. Now, how would the editor of the Adventist Review know how I vote? He just announced that we all voted. What if Justin Kim came out after the election, he says, I'm gonna tell you how all, the, all you Adventists voted. I wonder how the vote would turn out. Hmm. Hmm. Those of our people who voted at all in the last presidential election to a man voted for Abraham Lincoln. Ah, the devil's man now. There we go. We know of not one man among Seventh-day Adventists who has the least sympathy for secession. So there are 11 states that break away. And by the way, I just got to put this in here. Ellen White is not happy at all with the North and with President, with President Lincoln. His rationale for, for, preserve, for, for the Civil War ostensibly was to free the slaves. It wasn't. He was, it was simply to keep the union together. It was not an anti-slavery move. And she spotted that, smelled it out, and announces it. Wow. Okay. So, how will things turn out? Last Thanksgiving, 
we, for dinner, we had some friends over. And after we had uh, read the great Psalm 103, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that's within me, bless his holy name. And we had a prayer together, and we start passing the uh, potatoes and the gravy. And the, there went the veggie turkey. Did they invent the veggie turkey here in, in Battle Creek? Was that, was that Kellogg's? or? So well, as the food is being passed out, uh, I say, hey, guys, everybody, question, question. What do you think America will be like next Thanksgiving? Now, next Thanksgiving is much closer than it was last November. And the moment I said that, two split seconds later, there's just this groan. Why? The election. The election. And by the way, let's, let's just get this out. No matter which way the election goes, no matter which candidate wins, no matter which political party prevails, what we all know is, given the precedent of the last election, it may be days before somebody, number one, is declared a winner, and it may be that whoever the followers of the losing candidate will be in the streets. It may be that both candidates' followers are in the street. How can you say that, Dwight? Because America right now is hopelessly fractured. We are politically fractured. I'm not going to embarrass this room, but we are politically fractured. We are racially fractured. We are spiritually, socially, culturally fractured. We are fractured to the core. And to try to imagine, listen, I'm not worried about election day this year. It's the day after that I'm very concerned about for America. November 24, 1859, the review prints an extract from a political party, and I'm not gonna name the party, uh, and I know you wouldn't get by with that today. This is from that extract. Many feel that John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry is but a preliminary warning that God is about to take off his restraints from the, min from the ministers of vengeance and to let loose the avalanche. God himself is about to uncap the volcano if an insensate, a non, a, a lacking of sense, if an insensate, they lack sense, hardened people persist in the violation of this law. Judd Lake in his provocative book, and you have to read Judd Lake's book, A, a, a Nation in God's Hands. It's just, it's just, I read it over uh, the Christmas holiday. Uh, Lake writing here, America was on the verge of an epic crisis and did not realize it. Now watch this. They were at a point where only a straw would break the camel's back. That straw would be the upcoming presidential election of 1860 and the secession of southern states thereafter. Does it feel like sometimes we go, we go in full, we, we come full circle? The upcoming presidential election? America on the verge of an epic crisis? Come on. Let him, let her who has ears hear. Let those who have eyes look. What's up? Another of our beloved pioneers, one of the three, Bates, James, Ellen, founders, co-founders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, also buried in Oak Hill Cemetery. How did she regard this terrible fracturing of America by slavery? Ellen White, unspeakable outrages have been committed against a colored race. Unspeakable. I want you to consider her words here in uh, first volume of spiritual gifts. You know, that's a little set of books. They're, they're black covered, and there are two of them, and it's all four volumes. So I, I find the pages. What is the page here? 191 to 192. I think Judd calls this one of the strongest indictments against slavery in the antebellum period, period. Not just from Adventists, from anybody before the Civil War. Here it is. Professed followers of that dear Savior whose compassion was ever moved as he witnessed human woe heartily engage in this enormous and grievous sin. What's she talking about? And deal in slaves and souls of men 
angels have recorded it all. It is written in the book, the tears of the pious bondmen and bondwomen of fathers and mothers and children and brothers and sisters are all bottled up in heaven. Agony, human agony is carried from place to place and bought and sold. God will restrain his anger, but a little longer. His anger burns against this nation and especially against the religious bodies who have sanctioned and have themselves engaged in this terrible merchandise. Nobody beating around the bush now. You say, ah, oh, come on, Dwight, get over it. This is all this talk about slavery. Praise God, it's all behind us now. Oh, really? Oh, really? By the way, no collaboration between Kevin and me. I had no idea what he was going to present on. I had no idea what Michael was going to present on. But Karen said, don't worry about it, Dwight. The Holy Spirit obviously impressed both of you to deal with the same subject. But I'm going to deal with the root of slavery. All behind us now? <laughs> Three weeks ago, I came across this astounding discovery. Now, while I haven't seen this before, open your Bible, please, because I'm not, I, I, I'm going to put this on the screen, but I want you to see it in your Bible. Why had I seen this before? I've seen the phrase, I've, I, I've read through Revelation 18 again and again and again. This is the chapter on fallen, fallen is Babylon, that great prostitute and mother of harlots, and on and on and on. You know that chapter, Revelation 8, 18. But I want you to catch something here. All right, Revelation 18. I'll get back to that in just a second because there's one verse I didn't put up. Revelation 18, 2, with a mighty voice, this angel that comes down from heaven, and the whole earth is lightened with the glory of Christ. Oh, that's that mighty latter rain. That's that outpouring of the Spirit that we're living for and praying for. With a mighty voice, that angel shouts, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She's become a dwelling for demons and a haunt for every impure spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable animal. Then I heard another voice from heaven, the voice of God. Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive of her plagues. Terrified at her torment, Babylon's torment, the kings of the earth who are in her, in her lap, the kings of the earth will stand far off and cry, Woe, woe to you, great city, you mighty city of Babylon. In one hour your doom has come, and the merchants of the earth are going to weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargoes anymore. They've been selling to Babylon. What are they selling? Here we go. Cargoes of gold, silver, precious stones and pearls, fine linen, purple silk and scarlet cloth, every sort of citron wood and articles of every kind made of ivory, costly wood, bronze, iron and marble, cargoes of cinnamon and spice, of incense, myrrh and frankincense, of wine and olive oil, of, the fl of fine flour and wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and carriage carriages and human beings sold as slaves. That's to the very end of human history. Babylon has been dealing with the slavery of human souls. And then last night I noticed, ooh, just read the next verse. Don't have it up there. Verse 14, and they will say, the fruit you long for is gone from you. All your luxury and splendor have vanished, never to be recovered. She has longed for human beings sold in slavery. She's longed for it. She's gone, dead. The wicked witch is dead. And guess what? That's not just Babylon. That's America. America's in bed with Babylon by the time this comes true. In bed with her agenda. Am I saying something out of order here? No. All that you've longed for is now gone. Okay. Does it fit America? Turn your Bible a few pages back to Revelation 13. That's all marked up in my Bible. We talk about it, we talk about it, but I, when's the last time anybody took you through Revelation 13? Just boom, 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 boom. I'm going to do it right now. I'm going to give you five clues. Jot these down in your mind, if not on a piece of paper. Jot them down. You need to know why the... By the way, John Nevins Andrews was the one who, who crafted this understanding of Revelation 13, and Ellen White embraces it, and it ends up in great controversy. But I want to... You don't need John Andrews here. 
Just need you and your Bible. Watch this. Five clues. Here they go. Here's the verse first. Revelation 13, verse 11. Then I saw a second beast coming out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, but it spoke like a what? Spoke like a dragon. Clue number one, it springs up. The, the word that John uses there is anabino. It's the same word Jesus uses in the parable of the sea. And, and remember, some sea falls among uh, tares, and the tares spring up. That's, it's fast. It means quick. Springs up. Clue number one, whatever this power is, nation, whatever, it springs up. Clue number two, it springs up from the earth. In contradistinction to the earth is the sea beast, which is beast number one in, in, in Revelation 13, that comes out of the salty, briny sea. Watch this. Revelation 13, 1, and I saw a beast coming up out of the sea. It had ten horns and seven heads with ten crowns on its horns, and on each head a blasphemous name. So what's going on here? Well, the Bible uses embedded keys to unlock apocalyptic prophecy. And one of the keys is this one. When you see water, what does it represent? I'll show you. Let the book of Revelation explain that to us. Revelation 17, verse 15. Then the angel said to me, yo, John boy, the waters you saw where the prostitute sits. And by the way, the prostitute sits on the waters. The sea beast sit, comes out of the waters. Immediate clue to me, they're the same. They're the same power. Same power. Okay. The waters where you saw where the prostitute sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. Water in apocalyptic prophecy represents the masses, the people, thoroughfares of the human race. That was certainly true of the sea beast, which emerges out of the busy, peopled thoroughfares of Europe. So to describe, in contradistinction, this other beast, this earth beast, not out of the water, you, you would naturally conclude, and correctly conclude, by the way, what's the opposite of people and, 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 and densely populated? What would be the opposite? Sparsely populated. Few people. All right? Am I making something up here? Is somebody pulling a fast one on you? No. This is, this is what our pioneers came to conclude. Thank you, John Evans Andrews. So what do we have so far? Number one, we have a nation or power that's sprang up suddenly. Number two, in a desolate land far away from the thoroughfares of history. Here comes clue number three. Then I saw a second beast. Now, the word then always brings the time factor in. Something has been happening. Then this happens. So what's been happening before the sea beast, I mean, the earth beast is introduced to us? Well, that's a fair question. Let's just go to see. What's been happening? And by the way, you're going to see us, this, this uh, first beast, this sea beast, has taken the whole world by storm. Watch this. Revelation 13, verses 3 and 4. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have had a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. The whole world was filled with wonder and followed the beast. People worshiped the dragon, worshiped the, the devil because he had given authority to the beast. And they also worshiped the beast, the sea beast, and asked, who is like this beast? Who can wage war against it? Rhetorical question. Nobody can. Wow. So whoever or whatever the sea beast power is, it has been causing others to go into captivity. Really? Well, how do you know that? Because divine doom speaks to the sea beast and says, here's your fate. This is just a few verses later. Same chapter. Still talking about the sea beast. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. Let her hear. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with a sword must be killed with a sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Weren't you talking about that last night, Michael? There it is again. Not only Revelation 14, 12, it's stuck right here in the middle of this, this apocalyptic roaring and fury between these two beasts and their cohorts. So whoever this power is, it once was taking people into captivity. It goes into captivity. It once was with the sword slaughtering people. It now is wounded, mortally wounded. Should be fatal. But it mysteriously gets resurrected. We'll leave that beast out of our attention right now. It's interesting that, uh, and our historians here, all of them, will, will affirm that the Protestant reformers were rather you unanimous in their understanding of this sea beast. 
Daniel 7, Revelation 13, it is clear that this power is the Antichrist power that ruthlessly will rule the world from Rome. I'm not telling tales out of school. The great reformers, that's who it is. So what do we know? Well, this power really was wounded. 1798, the, at the conclusion of the French Revolution, Napoleon Bonaparte sends his general, Berthier, to the Vatican, Pope Pius VI, takes him captive, wounded, shuts the door. It happened. At that same time, then, this earth beast, fast, unpeopled. So what nation, come on, let's, do, let's just do the arithmetic here. What global power, power sprang, sprang far away from Rome and Europe in the barren new world around 1798? Hmm? There's only one such power on the planet today, and that is the United States of America. I'm not making it up. I'm not forcing an interpretation. He said, well, this is Satan. <laughs> Satan's, in, Satan's in the whole mess. Sea beast, earth beast, no beast, Satan. I get that part. But don't you try. Some have tried. Some of our liberal scholarship has just tried. Ooh, no, 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 no. You can't do that. You can't do that. Well, wait a minute, the little, the little woman said you can do that. She said you can do that. And you know what? Hold on to your pew. That little woman is looking brighter and brighter, smarter and smarter as every day's headlines go by. What we learned as boomers as kids, I don't think no, if the Gen Zers even get taught this anymore. But what the boomers learned, keep an eye, keep an eye on this country. It's a good land. Wow. Okay, I said there were uh, five clues. Here comes clue number four. It had two horns like a lamb. Now the lamb, as you know, the lamb, the lamb is the great hero of Revelation, right? I mean, they're singing songs to him. They're worshiping him. Everybody in the universe is rising up and saying, hail to the lamb. Worthy, worthy is the lamb. Who's the lamb? We know who the lamb is. It's our beloved Lord Jesus. Now he's the hero. I get it. And some find in this a fitting depiction of a peace-loving youthfulness, this two horns of a lamb business. You know, this, this kind of a lamb. It's a little lamb. Others have said, you know what those horns are? That would be uh, the twin values of civil liberty and religious liberty. Well, you can't, you can't nail it down from just looking at that line. But it gives me a chance to just give a shout out to Bettina. This magazine that she's agreed to, to uh, be the editor of. First thing I read always is your editorial. I always say, what has Bettina been studying the last 30 days? I want to see that. And uh, I'm proud of her. Uh, and the magazine, it goes to places you and I will never get to go to. I sponsor subs. Of course, it comes to my house, but I sponsor the judges and lawyers and government officials. And maybe the president of the United States himself will see this magazine. So I'm reading Liberty Magazine the other day, and I come across a piece by Ron Capshaw. It's a piece written about Roger Williams. You know who he is, the Baptist minister who founded Rhode Island. I just finished a biography of, of his friend of mine gave me it. I finished it just last uh, Sunday. Oh, my. Uh, Roger Williams and the creation of the American soul. Roger Williams is the one who was God raised up. I'm absolutely convinced. A Baptist minister cast out of, of the land where church and state combine, and that was early America in the New England states. Church and state worked hand in hand, and they said, you're out of here. We disagree with you. You're dead. Go. And he flees in the, at night in winter. Now, it's an incredible story. Anyway, so uh, here, here, here is Capshaw. Commenting, Roger Williams established the first area or colony to practice the separation of church and state in the New World. Okay? New world. He codified the idea that the government could rule only in civil matters. How did he put it? As such, the providence, because that became, that was his, the town he raised up and eventually became the capital of Rhode Island. The providence government could not punish those who violated the religious principles contained in the Ten Commandments, 
such as, and he's talking about the second table now. No, he's talking about the first table, rather. He says, listen, state, you can't, you can't deal with this state. Idolatry, this is, these are his words, he's actually writing. Idolatry, Sabbath breaking, false worship, and blasphemy. You can't deal with that. Why? Because that's not your business. It's the church's business. You got the state. You deal with the last six. We have the first four. And don't you get meddling with what we do with the first four. The laws of the first table of the Ten Commandments are not regulations for civil society or political order. They belong to the realm of religion, not politics. The Adventist Church has locked onto that from our founding pioneers. We will defend to our last breath the separation of church and state. How can that be? Well, it's exactly what we're doing. Roger Williams taught us to favor neither religion over government nor government over religion. Neither one. Just keep them separate. But something dreadful happens to this global superpower. And here's the last clue. Number five, it's, it speaks like a dragon. I used to think, until study just over the last three months, I used to think that, okay, it's a little lammy here, and then it becomes like a dragon here. And I realize, wrong boy, you're so wrong. It was dragon from the beginning. This whole slavery wound is because it was dragon from the beginning. My, oh my, oh my. And you made that point this morning very well, Kevin. The dragon's voice goes all the way back to our founding. I scribbled that down. It's good. Ellen White bluntly declares the whole system of slavery was originated by who? By whom? By Satan, who delights in tyrannizing over human beings. She goes on uh, in another quote. It is solemn mockery and Satan. What's solemn mockery? She's going to the, the idea of Christians buying and selling human beings during the week and then going on Sunday to worship the creator who made them equal. She says, it is solemn mockery and Satan exults over it and he reproaches Jesus and his angels with such inconsistency. Christians torturing their slaves and then worshiping God. He says, yo, and these are, this is her emphasis, the italics and the caps, saying with hellish triumph. So he's shaking his, his, uh, Diabolical finger at the God on the throne. Look, 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 yo, 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 these are your people. These are Christ's followers. Fine job you did with them. He mocks. How tragic. Steve Allred, a friend of mine, young Adventist attorney and pastor. We were just together at the Religious Liberty Summit out at PC, beginning of March. He's written the book, Do Justice, the Case for Biblical Justice. Here he goes. Historian Edward Baptist. He's not a Baptist, but he's an historian. In his book, The Half Has Never Been Told, Slavery and the Making of... Everything is in the title. That's all you need. Slavery and the Making of American Capitalism uncovers the history of how America's prosperity was built largely on the backs of enslaved back, blacks. Be speak like a dragon. Roaring like a dragon. Two little lammy horns roaring like a dragon. Is he Christian or is he dragon? Nobody knows. Yeah. Well, I'm thankful to tell you, Dwight, I keep having to remind you stuff, and I'm willing to interrupt you right now. There are, you've be got to know there are no slave owners left. Really? Really? No? Perhaps not. But the deadly root of slavery is still very much alive and well in America. Racism. Slavery is about racism. Racism is, isn't about slavery. Racism got here first. Racism. Ever heard of Christian nationalism? Yeah, we all have. But I'm, it's part of my mission just to remind Evans wherever I go. 
You better be thinking very carefully, bro, sis. You better be watching. You better be thinking, because I see where you know you're 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 on a path headed. You better you better look out. There's a growing movement in America of American evangelicals seeking to take control of American politics in order to advance their own political and spiritual agenda, an agenda that is more political than spiritual. I'm going to share a definition of pithy, I thought, from the, from the Anabaptist, we are Anabaptist, Mennonite Biblical Seminary just south of where I live, where Karen and I live, down there in Goshen, Indiana. Okay, so this is their definition of Christian nationalism. Christian nationalism, in short, is a worldview where one's theological imagination is co-opted by state power. Oh, keep reading. It exchanges a ch the church's loyalty to the Lord of peace for a false god fashioned by the myth of American e exceptionalism. We're the greatest. We'll make this country great again. It, it says, oh, wait, 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 wait. In fact, Christian nationalism is a form of political idolatry that distorts our knowledge of God and neighbor through a xenophobic, that's, that's fear of foreigners. Hey, no, 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 no. Through a xenophobic, racialized, racialized, militarized gospel that is at odds with the life and teachings of Jesus. That's one definition. Let me give you another one. Middle of December, I was waiting for this book because I heard it was coming. A bright young American journalist named uh, Tim Alberta I wrote the book. I'll just put the book on the screen here. The, la the, the last three nouns of the Lord's Prayer, all right? The kingdom, the power, and the glory. Colon, you got to get what's beyond the colon. Colon, American evangelicals in an age of extremism. Now listen, listen, listen. Think, think, think. Okay, so he reports on a survey, February 2023. This book is new. I mean, to get that printed and bound and then out in December uh, 2023, the book is fresh. In February 2023, a landmark national survey conducted by the Public Research Institute and Brookings Institution, no small and insignificant bodies, influencers in America, all right, uh, found, this survey did, that roughly two-thirds of white evangelicals, now that's the key, white evangelicals, two-thirds of them, either explicitly supported the nation, the notion, rather, of Christian nationalism or were sympathetic to it, two-thirds. The share of white e evangelicals who expressed support for certain ideas. Yo, Tim, what ideas were they specifically supporting? He said, so he puts a long uh, M dash there. I'm, I'm putting the numbers in, but there are three of them. Here they, here they come now. Number one, they support that the government should declare Christianity the state religion. That's number one. Number two, they support that being Christian is an important part of being an American. You Christian? No. Well, <laughs> second class citizen, that's what you are. I'm an American. And I'm a Christian. And I'll hate you right out of this room. Something's wrong with that. All right. Number, number, no, number two, that being a Christian is an important part of being an American. And number three, that God has called on Christians to exercise dominion over all areas of society. We have been raised up by God because this is a nation raised up by God, and we are going to straighten this society up if it kills us. No, if it kills you, we're going to straighten the society out. Now, what he's saying here because I'm not going to go back. What he's saying here, the share of white evangelicals who express support for certain ideas dwarfed that of white mainline, mainline Protestants, white Catholics, and Protestants of color. In other words, this is huge. Those people, those, those categories I just read, they're not saying this. The, the, the huge percentage is among white evangelicals. Now, there's one more line here. Nearly 90% of white adherents to Christian nationalism agree that God intended America to be a new promised land run by European Christians. Do you read my lips? They say to you and me. Those are the people that run America. The rest of you just come along for the ride. Guys, do you understand? Do you understand what, what, what's being described here? 90% of white adherents to Christian nationalism 
Well, he's not done yet. The broader sample, those other categories I just mentioned, responded, rejected that statement by a two-to-one margin. So the rest of Christianity said, no, no, wait, 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 wait. This is, this, the, that's, not our, that's not our vision. But white evangelicals say it's our vision. Now, I want to tell you something. That's about as racial and racially racist as you can get. I'm not making it up. You've seen two definitions. We, we could line them up here. So what's up? Do I believe that God raised America up? Absolutely. Do I believe that the founding fathers intended to create a Christian nation? Absolutely. Not. Not. John Meacham in his book, which I have in my library, Our, Our Founding Fathers, the title of the book is American Gospel, God, the Founding Fathers, and the Making of a Nation. John Meacham reminds us, this is, this is just, if you just remember one line when you're going to have conversations with people, this will do it. In a treaty with the Muslim nation Tripoli, initiated by Washington, the president, and ratified by the Senate in 1797, the founders of America, the founders of America declared that the government of the United States is not in any sense founded on the Christian religion. Period. Well, what's going on, Dwight? I'll tell you what's going on. There has been a desperate attempt recently, within the last 10 to 20 years, to revise and rewrite our history to fool evangelicals into a political agenda that if they were clear on, they would not back. They've been duped into a, an extreme political stance. And I fear that some Adventists are being drawn straight into the heart of this vortex, unthinking. Just feels right. Now, look, I'm a pastor. I've lived through the pandemic. Those were tough times. There's not anybody in this room that would, would, would disagree. Those were tough times. But interestingly enough, somebody used those tough times to divide Christianity, to divide Adventism, the followers of William Miller. Somebody used that to divide us, divide us. And I'm not going to tell you how. Because I'll get in trouble. Although I no longer pastor the Pioneer Memorial Church, so nobody can touch me now. <laughs> I see a few of the brethren from the Michigan Conference here saying, Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah? <clears throat> the fact of the matter is, ladies, brothers and sisters, the fact of the matter is, that God, God raised up this land to be a safe haven where church and state could be kept apart, Amen. where no king can rule the church Amen. and no pope can rule the nation. Amen. That's what we want. Do I believe God raised America up? Absolutely. Ellen White, the Lord has done more for the United States than for any other country upon which the sun shines today. We ought to treat that with sacred awe and not blow the one opportunity the Lord of the universe has given us. Just a few sentences later on the same page, however, comes this sentence. But in our land of boasted freedom, religious liberty will come to an end. Period. Whoa. So that's what Revelation 13 is about. Now I'm going to give a shout out to somebody who's in this room right now. And I added this last night. Because when I saw him here, I said, oh, that's right. I pulled my file out. Luckily, I brought it along. The most cogent summation of, of Revelation 13, 11, of 13, 11 to 16 that I have read, the most cogent summation, it's concise, was written by my friend Andy M. And I just typed this up in bed, Andy. I was thinking about you last night. <laughs> Andy M. from the Lake Union Herald. Thank you, Debbie. 
Adventists have interpreted Revelation 13 to mean that sometime in the future, a Christian nationalist government, namely the United States, will play a decisive role in the repudiation of religious liberty in this country and eventually the world. The catalyst behind this threat is identified in unambiguous terms, an influential groundswell of professing Christians and Protestant churches will one day persuade congressional and executive leadership in this country to pass legislation that will culminate in the abrogation of religious liberty and the enforcement of Sunday observance. That was well done. And that's the truth. Great Controversy says, spot on, and the end. Ellen White, in order for the United States to form an image of the beast, the religious power must so control the civil government that the authority of the state will also be employed by the church to accomplish her own ends. That's why Christian nationalism is a big deal to me. If we just sit here and not protest, there is one more option that might be even more effective than protest. Christian nationalism, I'll show you. We have to reach America before they do. Come on, we got a lot of Paro people sitting here. We have to reach our communities before they do. That's it. What are we gonna show them, Dwight? How, how, are, we gonna, how are we gonna do this? Now listen, listen, listen. We're going to love on them. We're going to love on them. There are guns out there. The big book came out in, in August. The great de-churching. The people who left church and have never come back. Adventist churches all across Michigan, all across the Lake Union, all across the North American Division. Every pastor I talk to, yeah, they have not all come back. The great de-churching. I call them the guns. They didn't call them that, but guns, because I need something to rhyme with the nuns. And who are the nuns? No religion. None of the above. None, none, none. The nuns have interpreted Christian nationalism as the truth about Christianity. And they said, I'm out of it. I would never join that church. Ever. Look how they treat people. Just these shades of racism that almost stand up to be noticed. But it's something, and I said, there's something not right here. It's racism. When you said today, the churches of the South, I forget what you said. Uh, I got my notes here. Do you remember saying something about the churches in the South? <laughs> <laughs> when you said that, come on, when you said that, Kevin. Oh, slavery still exists in the U.S. of A. Yeah, yeah slavery still exists. It's there. It's latent now. We are politically correct now, especially with the press, because we don't want the press on us, but it's all there, beneath the surface, just, just percolating, ready for that, for that mountaintop to blow. So we have to love on them. So I'm, I'm moving to my clothes, not quite. And I, I, I want to put somebody's face on the screen here. And his name will be beside his face. But first, let me say the only cure for white evangelical racism is to incarnate the radical love of Jesus and move out into our neighborhoods and tell the gons and the nuns, yo, 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 guys, 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 that's not us. No, what we do is we find the people who are suffering. We find the disenfranchised, the marginalized, and the alienated. We find them and we love on them. That's what we do. You do? Prove. Take a look. Well, that makes sense to me. Isn't that what, wasn't, wasn't that what Jesus was all about? You got it, bro. That's what he was all about. And that's what we do. No politics. We're not crusading. We're not trying to get somebody in office or out of office. We're staying out. But we're going to love on you so that you see a picture of Jesus you're not seeing. And we think that will lead you to conclude, here are they. They keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. We think you'll get the idea. Okay. John Byington. If you ever, ever want to borrow my picture for John Byington, Kevin just asked me. 
Say, Dwight, send me that picture because he's more handsome in that one than the one I put up. <laughs> John Byington. Brian, you know Byington. I should get, it, get you up here and interview you. Brian, Brian and I went to Southern College together all four years, worked in the history department together for the last uh, few months of our stay on that wonderful campus. John Byington, who, by the way, as a youth with his older brother, joined the American Anti-Slavery uh, Society. He soon became an active participant, as, as Kevin has so eloquently reminded us. He joined on the county level, then the state level. He then joined on the national level. He eventually became, as you heard, and he's right on, he became an agent for the Underground Railroad. That serpentine line of American families stretching up from the borders of the South, stretching up. You can stay here. You can stay here. You can stay here. You can stay. Shh. Come here. You can stay here all the way to, I like that, Canada. Right here. My, oh, my, oh, my. Tragically, I just want to give this comment. Tragically, before the Civil War, the federal government compromised with racism. Illinois was ticked off. Prophets can get ticked off. Lincoln. Now, this is this before Lincoln. She had her own issues with Lincoln. But when this country passed the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 that required citizens and law enforcement officers, anybody up here, you, you harbor a runaway slave with six months in jail and, and, and $3,000? Unbelievable. Unbelievable. When that law came out, Adventist historian Douglas Morgan, and these, these guys here know Douglas Morgan. And this is a great book, by the way. The, this is the Ellen White Encyclopedia. There is so much in that. And now there's this new uh, Encyclopedia of Seventh-day Adventists. Yeah. Douglas Morgan, in 1859, Ellen White defiantly expressed her outrage over the Fugitive Slave Act and asked her fellow believers not to obey this unjust law. We ought to obey God, not man. Don't obey this. The law, and now these are her words. First, first uh, it'll show up here at the end. First volume of testimonies. The law of our land requiring us to deliver a slave to his master, we are not to obey. And we must abide the consequences of violating this law. She's not saying, and then run. No, take the consequences, but be willing to take the consequences for the, for the cause of right and righteousness. Don't just duck down. We're not going to get me. Nobody's going to find me here. No, you stand up and say, I will not do that. In fact, you stay in my house. The slave, she goes on, is not the property of man. God is, is his rightful master, and man has no right to take God's workmanship into his hands and claim him for his own. She declares. Wow. John Byington did not bend to that prohibition. He said, how can I do this today? Just look at Byington. He doesn't do it. Civil disobedience. Take the consequences like a woman, like a man. But stand up. Speak out. Racism cannot happen where you work. If you're the guy standing up, you're the woman standing up and say, excuse me, excuse me, uh, brother employer, but this is not right. You're doing this for me and you're doing that for him. What's up with that? If somebody doesn't speak up, it just goes on. It perpetuates. In the school, if you're noticing that, you know, some classmates are just kind of getting, the teacher is just kind of not being fair at all. What's going on here? Excuse me. Excuse me. I think he had his hand up, and I think he's got a great point to make. I think she's got a good point. Listen to her. Just speak up. Stand up. Defend those who need, at that moment, a defense. They don't need you defending them. for They, get, they, they have their own lives. But there are times when you have, you have an opportunity that person doesn't, and you exercise that opportunity in favor of that person. That's what it is. Racism. Racism in the neighborhood. Racism in the church. We make a difference by taking a stand, no matter the price we pay for that. Now, according to my friend and church historian Brian Strayer, getting back to John Byington, because you, you wrote the piece, of course, in the SDA Encyclopedia, and it's all online, guys. Somebody was saying, was it last night, Michael? You're saying this, this thing getting attitude every day as we speak. It's incredible. You never have to buy the book. I have the old one. This thing is never out of date. 
So thank you, Brian, for writing that article on Byington. I'm going to quote my buddy Brian, all right? Recent evidence indicates that Byington built secret hidey holes. Kevin, you need to get that down. They're called hidey holes. I got that from this historian right over there. <laughs> they, they built secret hidey holes to conceal black fugitives in the Methodist chapel and in the parish house. He may have built one in his own house, but this cannot be confirmed as the house no longer exists. Good for you, Brian. Guys, what's happening? He's dealing with racism. He says, this is the way I'm going to respond to racism. I'm going to be proactive. I don't care what it costs to me. This is right. This is what God would do. This is what Jesus did. I've come to set the captives free. Luke 4, his inaugural sermon. All right. I got to sit down here. But not without saying. When this woman says, while we will endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit in the church, come on, we got to do that. We got church leaders here, and I don't want to be in trouble with them. While we endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit in the bonds of peace, we will not with pen or voice cease to protest against bigotry. And racism is bigotry to the core. This movement in America now is built on bigotry. And it's sucking people in. Well, we, we just gotta, we gotta be a part of something great. Well, you don't wanna be a part of this something. Because we saw what happened to Babylon with her racism. She ends up, she ends up on the ash heap of history. We saw that in the divine word. So we must speak up. We must speak out. Oh, how did Jesus put it? By this, America will know you are my disciples if you have love for one another. As I have loved you. You ought to love one another. He didn't say America, but he meant America. If you have love, this is how they know. You're all worried about those three angels' messages getting out. Just be like Jesus. The message will get out. Just be like Jesus. The message will get out. Now, if you're a pastor, that's not a get-out-of-jail-free card. You still must preach the three angels. Ah, wow. There's no other way to defeat racism than right there. Just like Jesus on Calvary. Did it cost him? Are you kidding? It cost him his life. It may cost you or me that one day. So what? Why not die for something that's worth dying for instead of living for the paltry visions and dreams that are dying on the vine in our own hearts and lives? Embrace something bigger than yourself. We're just hanging around this dumpy, humpty. That's nothing to live for. Nothing. Why are you living for it then? Come on. Let me close with a story. <laughs> Imagine my surprise. True story. When I read the autobiography of Malcolm X, written by Alex Haley, the great writer, Alex Haley. When I read the autobiography of Malcolm X, so Malcolm tells it to Haley, Haley tells it to me. I'm reading this. By the way, if you don't know who Malcolm X is, one of the great black activists of the 20th century who converted to Islam, imagine my surprise to his opinion about Seventh-day Adventists. I'm just reading it, minding my own business. In fact, you wouldn't believe me if I told you, so I'm going to put it on the screen. We'll just read the, the paragraph right here. About this time, he was 12 years old. My mother began to be visited by some Seventh-day, that's Haley's Spelling. Seventh-day Adventists who had moved into a house not too far down the road from us. They're living in Lansing, Michigan. So this is a Michigan story, which works for Battle Creek. They would talk to her for hours at a time. Got to be Adventists. They would, <laughs> they would leave booklets and leaflets and magazines for her to read. Oh, boy, that is. We began to go with my mother to the Adventist meetings that were held further out in the country around Lansing. For us children, I know that the major attraction was the good food they served. Can I get an amen for Adventist potlucks? Come on, give me an amen. We're going to get a good meal today. But, so here's the, here's, this, is, this is the caveat. But, we listen too. When you do nice things for people, they're kind, they, they really like the nice act that you did. But now they're listening to you. Man, you fed me. Oh, but we listen, says this 12-year-old boy, recalling the memory. But we listen too. There were a handful of Negroes 
from small towns in the area, but I would say it's 99, it was 99% white people. You got the picture? The Adventists felt that we were living at the end of time, that the world was soon coming to an end, but they were the friendliest white people I had ever seen. Man, he could have written something else. But that's what he wrote in his autobiography. And he had to check the manuscripts before they printed, published it. He said, no, I want that line in there. Isn't that something? They were the friendliest white people I had ever seen. Oh, my. Come on. I say, with Christian nationalism on the rise in America, people dominantly by white evangelicals, what an opportunity for black and white Seventh-day Adventists. We're evangelical. Of course we are. Black and white Seventh-day Adventists to band together to minister to the needs of a nation that desperately needs somebody to love on them. We band together. Blacks and whites. Has to be that way. Can't go off in our little corner. Can't go off in our little corner and do our little loving on the people. No, nah, something wrong with this loving. Something's missing here. This is the perfect chance for us in this union, Mr. President, to model the race, the, 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 the ethnic groups, blacks and whites, browns, yellows, to model coming together to do the work together. Man, the gods and the nuns are going to say, good grief, who are these people? This is my idea of America, but who are they? This is our chance. This is the moment. Ah, how did Jesus put it by this? America will know you are my disciples. If you have love for one another, as I have loved you, you ought to love one another. Yeah. What do you say? Let's turn this little uh, exercise in uh, early, early pioneers in civic engagement. Let's turn this little exercise into a moment for recommitment. How about you becoming the person in your congregation? You become the person taking the initiative to create these moments where we come together, not apart. We come together, not politically, not with any ambition for America, except that they might see Jesus and come to love him as we do. Would you like to be that radical agent of, of, of changing love? Would you like to be that radical agent? I would. And I can't think of a better place than sitting in this building, standing in this building from 1857 to 1867 that was the worship place of the people we've come to admire over the decades. And we'll take a stand just like him. Michael, send us to the whole world, Jesus. Not just America. Send us to the whole world. That's what you were talking about. If you want to be that change agent, don't stand because somebody around you is standing. I'm telling you, God's looking at your heart right now. He's reading that mind of yours. Oh, boy, here he goes. We can get to, we can get to dinner sooner if I stand. No, he's reading your mind right now. He knows exactly what you're thinking right now. If you're thinking, I want to be a change agent with radical love for the people around me, and I'll unite with anybody that loves Jesus. If you're thinking that, stand, stand to your feet, because I'm thinking that. I have to think that while I talk it. But stand with me. Oh, Jesus. Look at you on the cross. Look at you. Greater love has no one than this than to lay down his life for his friends. And you call the whole planet your friends and you lay down your life for everybody. We stand with the conviction that you need us to live out that love in the circles where we move, in the church, outside the church, wherever you put us. Please, Jesus, let our witness be true to you and your Radical love. And oh God, please, save Americans. You won't be able to save this country. But save Americans. And use this group standing before you to do just that in partnership with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.